notice row after row after row of books oriented towards spiritual quests, faith, miracles, seeking God, and all manner of particular New Age spiritualities. That's what we have here. The fact is the human species, as a species, we as a planet, can no longer live with the old gods, and that includes the Christian God. Now let me qualify that. I'm not referring to the God and Father of Jesus, nor the uh, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, the classic Nicene doctrine of the Trinity. I'm referring to what Christianity has done with God. With me on this? And um, <clears throat> I have a, a lot of books that explore where it is in church history. We made these kind of decisions that have left us in the 21st century with a Christianity and a God uh, that is dysfunctional, criminal. Uh, when you pray, you hope that God ain't been drinking, you know. Has an anger management problem. I mean, there's, there's just so many problems with the way that Western Christians... Uh, and I should say Eastern Orthodoxy, Eastern Christians, both Russians and Greeks, have portrayed God uh, in the Christian tradition since the second century. But actually it goes back into the first. All of these things that, that are embedded in us, we have 2,000 years of Christian doctrine embedded in us. And so what we think about God, um, it, it, it comes from somewhere. It does not come from the Holy Ghost. All that you know about God comes from some. We've learned it from a parent, a teacher, a pastor, the radio, the shows you listen to, TV, books you read. It's all out there. And what we want to do is, well, hello, Mr. Wexler. Hello, Rachel. No, that's all good. Have a seat. Nice to see you guys. All right. So what we want to do is we want to get back and we want to look specifically how the early church is perceiving this whole God thing. And in particular, we're going to look tonight and tomorrow at three writers. Tonight, we're going to look at Paul. Tomorrow, we'll look at Paul two more times. We'll look at the epistle to the Hebrews, and we'll look at the gospel of John. Now, other than Zach, who just entered, and of course, Robert and Will, who've already heard these questions, let me ask you this. How many New Testament books begin with a song? What would you say? How many New Testament books begin with a song? A hymn? Did you know there are at least six? Did you know that the uh, New Testament writers quoted their hymns? The songs they were singing are quoted as texts. You know, the hymn book or the song book is the theology book of the church. What you sing is what you believe. And that's frankly why I have trouble going to church, because I can't stand the songs. The songs in contemporary Christian churches are narcissistic, Jesus is my boyfriend, I've got this incredible love relationship, ooh, ah, ah. I mean, it's, it's all self-centered. It's what can I get out of Jesus? What can God give me? What can you do for me today, God? I'm praying and pulling the one-armed bandit. When are you going to do something? And this is the God that's in the church today. And this is our singing. And our singing also sadly consists of a practice that the New Testament writers avoided entirely. In fact, they actually spoke against it. And that's this practice, the practice of believing that God is angry. And when Jesus dies... On the cross, his blood somehow makes God feel better because God really is a vampire. And so then God's anger management problem is dealt with and we're loved. This is known as the penal substitution theory of the atonement. It comes from John Calvin in 1539. It is not part of the Christian tradition. It is not part of the New Testament. But it is the default position of evangelicalism and charismatic Christianity. In other words, the cornerstone of the evangelical tradition and charismatic Christianity is its stepchild, is the exact opposite of where the New Testament writers are going. And that's why people are fleeing the church today by the millions every year, why the Pew Research studies have moved from the nuns, N-O-N-E-S, the people that when they, what religion are you? I'm a nun. To the duns and why the church is losing all its leadership. 
people that have been teaching in churches for, for decades, leading committees and elder boards and these guys, they're fleeing, they're leaving. Why? Because they know that the dog and pony show that it constitutes most Christian worship is BS. And I've seen it in Vegas, I see it in Pennsylvania, I see it in Australia, it's BS. You want to know why? People are going to church to find out whatever they can get from God. And that's not the gospel. So we want to look at some hymns. We want to look at what, when the early church wrote their song, was there a structure? Was there a format? Was there a center? Did they have something that they were moving toward? So do you have Bibles? So if you have Bibles, please turn to Ephesians chapter 1. In 40, in the, if figuring Paul's converted around the year 40, uh, I'm sorry, 33, or actually October of 34, Figure it's about seven years later he writes the first and second Thessalonian letters. And if you've read those letters, you know that they read nothing like Paul's other letters. These letters are still stuck with some kind of an angry God, uh, a, 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 a kind of a, a way of viewing the end of times, uh, you know, that's going to be really, really bad, this kind of thing, you know. And, and uh, these, this is Paul in the Thessalonian letters. Now, remember, he's been, quote, converted back in 34. He's still stuck in this thinking in 41. But there's a shift that occurs in Paul. He doesn't write about it, but you can see it when you read the letters that he writes in 50, 51, and 1552. Paul's went into a flurry of letter writing. Early in 50, he's in, he's being um, ca held captive by the uh, Roman authorities and he writes Philippians, Ephesians, Colossians, and Philemon's, and he's released. And then over the course of the next 18 months, he will write Romans, Galatians, Corinthians, the two letters to the Corinthians, Philipp, uh, um, uh, bup, 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 what are the other Pauline letters that are authentic, whatever they are. But Timothy and Titus, those are not written by Paul. Those are written by someone else that thought they knew Paul but didn't. Now, you already notice I'm starting to, like, criticize the Bible a little bit, right? That's because I'm approaching it as a historian, okay? I approach it first as a historian and only second as a believer. Why? Why would somebody want to approach the Bible as though God does not exist and just read it as an ancient text before they went to the text and ask to be spoken to? Why would somebody do that? Huh? It, it certainly eliminates a lot of the subjectivity, doesn't it? Doesn't it? Right? I am not a believer that the Holy Ghost told me. And the moment somebody says the Holy Ghost told me, I just nod my head and go, okay, where's the Prozac? You know? I don't buy into that. Why? We do all of our work together in community. Bible study is a community project because we are relational beings. And you're about to find that out in this first hymn. Now, look at your text. We're going to be reading Ephesians chapter 1. Paul begins the, with a standard greeting that's a formula in all ancient Greek letters. You find this in the papyri in Egypt when a son writes his father because he's on a long journey. And he says, you know, Joe, uh, the son of Bill, dear, you know, bup, 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 dear dad kind of thing. So Paul has stated this initial greeting. Here's the hymn. What I'd like you to do as we read the hymn is see if you can identify the chorus. You know how you do verse, chorus, verse, chorus, verse, chorus? You ready? Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with each spiritual blessing in the heavenlies in Christ just as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of civilization to be holy and without blame. Before him in love, he elected us for adoption through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he bestowed upon us in the beloved, in whom also we have the redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our sins, according to the riches of his grace, which abound toward us in all wisdom and insight, having made known to us the mystery of his will, 
according to the, what? What do you have? According to the good pleasure of his will and according, right? Do you see that phrase, according to the good pleasure of his will? Is that the second time it's been repeated? Mm Mm-hmm. For the purpose of bringing about the um, fullness of times to sum up all things in Christ, both things that are spiritual and things that are earthly, in whom also, having been chosen beforehand according to the plan of the one who energizes all things according to the counsel of his will, that we might be to the praise of his glory, who first hoped in Christ, in whom also, having heard the word of truth, the gospel of our salvation, in which we believed, having been sealed by the Spirit of the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the um, down payment of our inheritance for the redemption of the circumference of our lives to the praise of his glory. What's the chorus? What's the chorus? How many times does to the praise of his glory get repeated? You will notice this is sometime in the year 50 or 51, just 17 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus, that in Ephesians 1, 3 to 14, verses 3 through, I'm going to put um, 6a, the first part of 6a, and then you have the second part of 6 down through 12, and you have 13 and 14. And after each one of these, you have to the praise of his glory. Now look at your text. I need you to, I need you to interact with me here. Some of you are Pentecostal. I know this. I know this. Or you need coffee or something. But let's engage here. Who are verses 3 through 6 about? Who does it specifically say 3 through 6 is about? The Father. How about 6b through 12? The Son. And how about 13 and 14? Spirit. What do you have there, my friends? What do you have there? You have a full-blown doctrine of the Trinity, don't you? Right there. 17 years after the death of Jesus. That's the first recorded full-blown doctrine of the Trinity right here. It's saying something, though. You'll notice there's none of this weird language like we get in the creeds. Anybody grow up Catholic or or these kinds of things? Did you all grow up Protestant or... Catholic. You'll remember on Sundays we'd go to church and we'd do the Nicene Creed, which by the way is a beautiful text. But we'd get up there and we'd go, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, God of God, light of light, true God of true God, begotten and not made, born of God before all ages, God of God, light of light, ba 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 ba. We'd do all this of one being with God, you know. What the heck's all this mean? What the heck does all this is all language of Greek philosophy that they're using in Nicaea in 325, isn't it? Is Jesus, is he the same being as God, and is God a person, and how do we understand persons, and if the Father's a person and the Son's a person, are they different? Or, you, know, you understand all these questions they're asking in 325? They're not asking, Paul's not asking any of those questions here, is he? None of them. And yet, he seems to have an understanding of God as Trinity that it seems so much more robust than that of the Nicene Creed. So what is it that the Father does? When Paul's singing this hymn, when when either he composes this hymn, which I think, frankly, this is a composition of Paul, Paul the songwriter. If if it's not, that's fine too, but but for tonight, I'll just go ahead and work with that. So you have Paul writing this song. Why? Why start the letter off with the song? Why do you sing? Okay, okay. Do you sing to the radio in the car? Yeah, right? Sing at home, sing in the shower. Why do you sing? Why do you sing? Yeah, well, that's just you, bro. (laughs) You'd beat me here. But why do we sing? Because music brings something to the equation that words just don't, right? 
Helps you memorize it, doesn't it? So you have here this hymn. Three parts, Father, Son, and Spirit. So let's look at how Paul decides to describe the work of the Father. And let's talk about this text and the way what Christians have done with it. And let's ask, if we really, 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 really want our singing and our worship to be conformed to some kind of apostolic pattern, if we really want to think it through, and by the way, this does not mean repeating what they do literally. It means finding the trajectory that they started and moving along that road. Okay? Blessed is the God and Father. There's the Abba. Right there. Abba. Remember Jesus' language? The Aramaic use of a term? Remember, Paul's writing to Gentiles who don't know Aramaic and twice in to the communities in Rome and to the house churches in Galatia, he uses this term Abba, it's an Aramaic phrase, but evidently was so important to the historical Jesus that it carried over even into Greek-speaking churches. See what I'm saying? The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us. Now, notice this is a double blessing. Same term is used, eulogitos. Blessed is God, just so you know this. When you sit down at meals, and you go, Lord, bless this food, right? No Jew would bless the food. They would bless God. This is how narcissistic we've become. And it is the deadliest thing in Christendom right now that anything is I, me, my. It's killing us. There would have been a blessing for God before the meal and a blessing at, at the meal's end, but it was God that was blessed, not the food. God was thanked. You see the difference? We're looking for a magic show. Come on, God, do something with this food, abracadabra, make it like, you know. That's just us. You don't find that. It, it, no Jew would do that. They still don't. So in this first bit, this first verse, what we have is a God who is on our side. God blesses us. Whatever it means with every spiritual blessing, whatever Paul means by that, who knows? And in the heavenly places, whatever Paul may mean by that, the point is, as you move on, just as he has chosen us in him, here's where the Calvinists get it wrong. They've got this doctrine of election where God stands apart and eternity past decides some go to heaven and the lottery decides most go to hell. Paul says no. God chooses us in Jesus. The way God engages Jesus is the way God engages us. This is Paul. With me on this? As you move forward, what you've got is a purpose clause. What's, what's the reason that we are cho chosen before the foundation of civilization? We're chosen to be holy and blameless. And this has nothing to do with moral codes or the religious right or any of this. It's the language here of those who, it's the language of sacrifice. But for Paul, this language is completely turned over so that we are those who are giving ourselves away all the time. And I could show you this from Romans 12, 1 and 2 in particular. When Paul says we're to be holy and blameless, it has nothing to do with some kind of righteous path we're to follow. It has everything to do with becoming those who give ourselves away as sacrifices to others. In other words, so uh, Robert and I are together. I may choose, knowing I have grocery money in my pocket for the week, but we're together, and I may choose to give it to him because he needs it. You, you understand that's giving yourself away. This is the kind of thing Paul says God chose us for. God chose us to be the ones who pour our lives out for others, who are loving others, showing compassion and mercy. And you'll see all of these characteristics in this God in this text. God in this text is not angry. God in this text is not someone to fear. God for Paul has revealed God's self to be unlike the gods, who from archaic religion forward have two faces. 
a blessing face and a cursing face. And this Janus-faced or two-faced God is the problem in all religion. And so Paul's going, the father of Jesus doesn't have a dark side. And we've got to get that. So, okay. We, he, he does this and he says, he chose us for adoption. We, we belong. I mean, I don't, to, to move for much more forward than this other than to say we belong to Papa um, is, is to move past, I think, what, what Paul is doing in the text. But where does the adoption come through? What's your text say? Jesus. Now, I want you to notice this. How many times in this three-verse hymn does Paul use the name of Jesus or relative pronoun in whom or in him? You count them? How many times does Paul say in Jesus Christ or in Christ or in him, through him, Quite a few. Eleven. Eleven times. He will have a Jesus-centered him. All this work that God does from Paul's perspective is to be found in the figure Jesus of Nazareth. It's a very Jesus-centered him, isn't it? Unlike so many of our songs in our tradition, which just reference a generic God. You know, dear God. Um, we will see tomorrow that Paul has a very specific reason for becoming very Jesus-focused. And this is, it goes like this. The modern question is, is Jesus like God? That's the modern question. Is Jesus like God? The assumption is, we know what a God is, but we don't know who Jesus is. The early church didn't ask that question. They knew who, or they thought they knew who God was as Jews. And when Jesus comes on the scene, the only question they can ask is, is God really like Jesus? In other words, Jesus' life reframes their view of God. That's what's happening here. It's the one thing that Christianity does not want to happen. You know why? If you have a God that's all powerful and sovereign, if that's your dominant model like you find in the Baptists and the Calvinists and, and certain other traditions then you, you, as a human being, are going to be precisely that in relations to others. I'm your pastor, Jay. I have, a, I have power over you. But if your God is powerless, if your God hangs on a cross, if your God does not save God's own self, then as a member in the body of Christ, that would be who I would be. You live your view of God. You live it. So if you, if you want to know someone's theology, they can tell you till they're blue in the face what they believe because they're just indoctrinated and they're just parroting whatever the pastor says. But look at a person's life. Are they merciful? Are they compassionate? Are they giving? Are they healers? Are they um, uh, caring, nurturing, hospitable? Name, name all the characteristics you see in Jesus' ministry, and that's the question. So when I look at Christianity, and I see Christians justifying war, justifying torture, as the evangelicals did uh, this, this past number of years, uh, justifying all manner of death-dealing practices in, in human culture, from the incarceration uh, pr private prison system, which is just decimating the African-American community, to the death penalty, which is doing the same thing, I have real questions about that Christianity. In fact, I'll be so bold as to say they don't know Jesus. They have no clue, none at all. Well, when you move on through the hymn, you're going to find out who this Jesus is. Paul begins in verse 6. This praise, uh, the praise of the glory of his grace, which, now it's this grace that's the reference here, which, he graced us with, it's a repetition. The noun grace becomes the verb graced. It's a, and when you repeat something like that, it's for emphasis, isn't it? Right? Do you know what grace is? Does anybody really have an idea what grace is? We use the term. We throw it around. Charis. 
What's it mean, grace? How many of you celebrate some kind of birthday or holiday that requires gift giving? Well, Christmas, for example. You ever run into this at Christmas? You go to buy your significant other or somebody important in your life something, and you think to yourself, you know, last year they got me this, and I didn't get them as much, wasn't worth as much, so this year I better get them something worth something so that they, you, you do that in your heads? Play the games. I just, you know, what does my wife want? Well, she's got me this land. Do you know what I'm saying? We do this. Do you ever go to somebody's house that's invited you to dinner empty handed? Or do you go to the pastry shop or the liquor store and bring a bottle of wine? What do you do? Right? We live in an economy of exchange. We exchange our time for a paycheck, our paycheck for cash, our cash for goods and services. Religion is about an economy of exchange. It's about asking God, or giving God something so that God will give us back something. I mean, I remember a desperate prayer when I was 16 years, uh, 17, 16, 17 years old, and I was a desperate prayer. And I, I told Jesus, you know, if he'd just give my girlfriend her period, I promised I would do something. She did, and I didn't. You know, but we do these, don't we? We, it's, it's, you know, it's, you know, it's like, it's like I'm staying at the Luxor and I'm in the casino and, and I'm, I'm, I've got this five dollar bill in my pocket. And I've never gambled, you know, and it's kind of like I want to go to a machine and go, dear Lord, I promise, if I win, I'll give it all away to charity, you know, kind of thing we do. It's about economies of exchange we give to get. We do this in our relationships, our marriages, everything we give to get. The term economy of exchange is important here. It's the foundation of religion and culture. There is no religion and no culture without this exchange thing going on. Grace, charis, is a giving with no expectations, a giving with no strings attached. It's a giving because because God is just giving. And we've met people like that. We've had grandmothers or grandfathers or mothers or fathers or, or friends who were just that way, right? When they gave, the, there were no strings attached. They just gave. That's grace. When God gives, God is a giver without expectation. And that's what grace is. So when Paul says in this particular text, to the praise of the glory of his grace, He's referring to the character of this, this pater, this Abba, this father, as just a giver, a life giver. That's how Paul's perceiving God. Notice there's nothing in here about God being angry, about humans being sinners. You don't have any of that language here, do you? None of it. That's all from Augustine and, and Calvin. And, the, and, of course, we are the heirs of this nasty, nasty God and terrible view of ourselves, which he has graced upon us in the beloved. There's another, there's one of your 11 phrases that was, notice, where is the grace demonstrated? In Jesus. In whom we have, in whom, there's another one. We have this redemption through his blood. Now, before we, if I was to preach a sermon on this text, I'd have to go into why this text is not saying that Jesus' blood is somehow necessary to appease God's wrath. Blood is a metonym for death. It's just another way of saying death. Through the death of Jesus, we've been redeemed. How? How? What does Paul say? How are we redeemed? What is it that happens? We're forgiven. Now, We've been taught in the West that Jesus bore our sins on the cross. You know, and every time I cursed or said a bad word or, or did something bad or did drugs or had sex, I wasn't supposed to. And, I, and Jesus took all these little sins and peccadillos and, he, and God put them all on Jesus. Oh, the burden of seven billion people's sins is he's hanging on the cross. And that's not what Paul is saying. There's nothing to do with that. Look about Calvary. Look about it. Look, what do you see, you three, three crucified terrorists, soldiers, interlocutors, people that are mocking Jesus, religious authorities, and a couple of his followers, and that's what you see. And as he is dying, 
he will repeat a particular phrase over and over and over and over again. Luke 23, 34 says, And Jesus kept on saying, Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. He's talking about the executioners, the soldiers. He's talking about the religious authorities. He's talking about the Pharisees, the Essenes, and others who make fun of him. And he's talking about his disciples, most of whom fled, betrayed, ran, denied, etc., etc., etc. Father, forgive them all. The cross is the place where humanity is forgiven. Space and time is redeemed. This is what Paul is asserting here. It's a cosmic vision that is happening on the cross. Not a me and Jesus thing. It's cosmic. It affects you as well as me. You with me on this? Okay. Again, in Christianity, it's if I accept Jesus into my heart, then bang, I get all this good stuff. And Paul says, no, what God has done in Christ has affected the universe. We're going to see that in this hymn. We're going to see it in the next one, and the next one, and the next one, and the one after that. Jesus simply is not interested in you as an individual. He's interested in us as a people. We are relational beings. And as long as we continue to think like enlightenment people, like post-18th century uh, uh, persons of modernity who are focused because of the influence of Jean-Jacques Rousseau and others on this autonomous self. I'm my own being. I am my own thing. When we think this way, we're denying the realities of modern science, neurophysiology, which says that our brains are co Xerox machines. All we're doing is copying each other all the time. Whatever someone wants or thinks, we're just, cop we're just copy machines. All of this has produced a Christianity that essentially is all about me, my growth, my potential, my, 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 my. And I hear this all the time. I go to church on a Sunday morning, and all I hear is how to be a better person, how to get richer, how to get this, that, and the other. And I'm just sitting there, and I'm going, where the hell is the gospel in all this? Where, what has God done? It's not there. So Paul's making a case that this whole thing that occurs is cosmic. It's not just about us as human beings. You ready for this? It's also about the earth. Because we're going to see in a moment, Paul says that it is all things. And when it comes to the Colossians hymn that we'll study tomorrow, Paul makes very clear it's about the creation itself. Sun, moon, stars, wind, water, fire. It's about, it. it's about the creation. What, what Jesus does redeems the creation, not just a few people. Moving on, oh, this, this forgiveness is according to the, look at this, the, the overflowing riches of this grace that just keeps on giving. You know, God's, this energizer buddy just keeps on giving and giving and giving for Paul, which he abounds on us in all divine downloads. How many of you have been in a church where you got people that stand up and they do this God told me thing, Okay. 99.999% of the time, it's just them projecting. They're just projecting. They're just doing what everybody else does. The guy that walks in the door, I have a prophecy for you, man, bop, 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 and you're just going to go, Pfft. you know? Okay, let's, let's get real here. We have to, as it were, clean the temple out of the nonsense, and that includes also understanding this business of wisdom and insight. Wisdom and insight are gained through study. Wisdom and insight are gained in community. Wisdom and insight are gained from elders. Wisdom and insight are gifts of God that we discover together. You'll notice this entire passage. It's we, we, us, us, we, we, us, us. And in every hymn we read, that's what it is. We can't do a God thing by ourselves, according to Paul. There's no such thing as some independent mystic out there, you know, getting drunk on the Holy Ghost and getting divine downloads. That's, again, that's nonsense. And it's the same for the uh, Baptists who actually think that because the Bible is somehow inerrant, that when they read it, they've got the inerrant interpretation. You've been to these churches, right? See, you're welcome to disagree with 
my interpretation of Paul, I could be misinterpreting Paul. I really could. But that's what we're focused on here, is whether I'm hearing Paul. So he says, God has made and known to us the mystery of his will. Notice, notice this language, made known to us the mystery. The mystery doesn't exist anymore. There's no mystery in God. There's no mystery anymore. And all the Christian mystics that are out there trying to discover something new in God, they're just fooling themselves. There's nothing new. It's all here. This is Paul. It's all there. Bang. There's no new revelation. There's no new nothing. What there is is wisdom and insight. Are we wiser than Luther was 500 years ago? Yeah. This is, you know, the year that we celebrate the 500th year of the Reformation. <clears throat> Does that mean we go, we go and say to ourselves, well, we really don't know anything more? Of course we do. Gosh, we've got modern, so all the advances in modern science and the things we've learned through all manner of disciplines, we have wisdom and insight. We have it together. He moves on. According to, the good, to, the, to, the, to his good pleasure, which he purposed in him, for the, here's this purpose clause. Notice this. To bring together, to wrap up into one kind of package, the fullness of times. Time after whole, all, we're talking space and time here. We're talking physics. We're talking this, this reality that we know is creation. All things, all things. To sum up, to sum up everything. See that? Everything. Everything. Every person, every stone, everything. In Christ, in whom also, having been called according to the purposes of his plan, and then you have this rather strange phrase in Greek, and it goes like literally like this. According to the plan of the all things having energized according to the counsel of his will. And what Paul's simply saying is that this God makes redemption happen. That's what this God does. The West, the Christian West, the, the tradition that we're in, has taught us that God is like Superman. He's in the sky, he's up there, or he's a Calvinistic puppet master, and when we run into trouble, all we got to do is go, I need help. I'm, I need your power. I'm powerless. And we don't realize that the New Testament writers, particularly Paul, would find that a totally false position. The reality is our God is powerless. I don't know if you can imagine this. Our God is powerless. The two biggest moments, as it were, in the history of God in creation, there's this bada-boom, bada-bing creation thing, and I'm referring to the Genesis myth here, you know, how it's done in seven days, and, and it is a myth, but it's, there's creation here. And what do you have at the end? God takes the planet and gives it to who? Us. God's given up power of the planet to us. There's, there's one. Where's the second place you find God absolutely powerless? On the cross. It is virtually impossible for Western Christendom to get this because if God is powerless, how do we pray? If God is powerless, what does it mean to follow a powerless God? What does it mean to follow a powerless God? What does it mean to follow a God who knows intimately the sufferings of the broken, the weak, the crushed, the oppressed, the marginalized, the fearful? What does it mean to follow a God like that, you know? Rather than a God that sits up on some mighty throne somewhere, just kind of, you know, bored contemplating reality and once in a while dropping the trap door so somebody gets to burn in hell and he smells something new. Not this God, not for Paul. Not at all. And so he moves on finally and he will, <clears throat> as everything is wrapped up in Christ, he then goes on to say that to the praise of his glory, of his grace, we who first hoped in this Jesus figure in whom also, now we come to the third part, having heard this message of truth, this truth about who we are as a human species, and the truth about who God is and that God is not like us. The gospel of our healing in whom having believed we were sealed with the spirit of promise who is the down payment 
of our inheritance. This is all economic language, by the way. It's all language of, of economics. Uh, Paul's using the, the language of, um, like, a, when you buy a house, you put a, a, a down payment down, you know, 10%, 20%, and then you get a loan, okay? The, when you, Paul's saying, when God gives the Spirit to us, <laughs> that's the down payment. We, we, in other words, we have the down payment. We're just waiting for the rest of the cash to come through. This is his hymn. This is his God. Is this God different than the God of Christianity as you have experienced it? And that's the question I want to leave you with tonight as we begin to reflect together how the apostolic church was absolutely astounded by this revelation that the character of God was different than they could imagine. And so that's where we'll begin our conversation.